All right, welcome back Prospect Live viewers and listeners. We're back with a very special episode of the MLB Draft Podcast. That is, of course, the 2021 MLB Draft Podcast. 2020 already happened. Joining me today, of course, is Joe Doyle, our director of draft content, and also joining us today, a very special guest, uh, one of my heroes in this game, that is Jim Callis of MLB Pipeline. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Welcome, my friend. Thanks. So this has been, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit off the air. This has been a much, much different year for you. I know that we got 11 months until draft day, and, and that doesn't go unmentioned. But how much, how, how different has this summer been for you with, with no Cape League and, you know, uncertainty around showcases and things like that? Just how are you, you know, maintaining your sanity? Well, the one thing that's helped a little bit is usually during the summer, I mean, we are doing draft stuff. We're doing minor league stuff. We're doing prospect stuff. We're doing top 30s. We don't like really dive in with both feet until we do a top 100. It usually comes out right before the winter meetings. Mm-hmm. And the draft, the 2020 draft really kept me sane because that was kind of business as usual. Even though there weren't games, that part was a little different. I was still talking to a bunch of people. People had played this year. So that part was normal. You know, the summer's been weird because my schedule's been totally different. Like last year, it was the first prospect development pipeline league, PDP league, the MLB started. The USA Baseball that went on for three weeks, and you had I think it was eighty of the best high school players there. And I spent a whole week down there watching guys. And then that didn't exist this year. And then we went from that. They took the can't remember how many guys it was out of that forty or fifty. Went to Cleveland and they did a high school futures game. So we got to see them again. And then I got to see um, the Under Armour All America games, always in my backyard at, at Wrigley Field. Mm-hmm. And got to see him again. So I got to see all these guys, you know, even guys like Zach Veen wasn't at the PP league, but he was at the, at the Under Armour game. And it was like, whoa, this guy seems like he's better than Pete Crow Armstrong and Dylan Cruz and all these other more highly padded outfielders. And, you know, and Jared Kelly was a guy who wasn't a PDP, but you saw later. So anyway, mm-hmm. that part's been really weird, not seeing these high school guys at all. I mean, my only real stuff I've done with high school guy, I did a story in the area code games last week where I talked to like, half dozen people in baseball about who look at the area code games. The college side is just really weird because, you know, there's no Cape. There, there's, there's no, I mean, I guess there's a hit and miss leagues with random players. Yeah. No real, I mean, they're organized, but it's like, you can't really say, Oh, like Judd Fabian's here or Kumar rockers there. Like I haven't even looked, I, I don't know who the best college player is playing summer baseball somewhere that you can see him. Do you, are you guys, well, you, I mean, I, you're uh, not gonna find you're not gonna find Kumar. He's not yeah. playing. You're not gonna nope. find Lighter. Nope. Fabian is playing down for Did Orlando. Florida, yeah, he's Did going. They get that going? going? Yeah, uh, Florida. Yeah, I think we that league. So we've um, talked about this. One of the, yeah. one of the one of the tough things is with the Cape, you have so many of the premier talents in one place, whereas it's so spread out, you know, Judd Fabian is playing against guys that play for the university of South Valley, Florida state college, you you know? So, um, you know, and like Matt McClain is playing at at the independent, um, Foresters team at Santa Barbara. He's batting, he's batting 600 quite literally. So it's like, take it all with a grain of salt. Yeah. I mean, so you might be able to see the guy, but like, in like, I know, like I love the Cape league. It's one of my favorite things, baseball. And, Every year, they're kind enough to send me their their preseason, postseason yearbook, and I can't tell you how many times I pop that open. I mean, I could look it up on the internet too, but it's actually easier to navigate. Where it's got everybody's stats in there, and it's like, oh, so and so hit 180 with a 35 percent strikeout rate, or hey, this guy like Hayden Cantrell had a really rough spring at Lafayette, but he, you know he hit 300 on the Cape, yep. and guys still you know guys saw him there and believe he can hit. Um, and so you don't have any of that. But yeah, it's like we were saying off the air. I don't even know what to expect for next year's draft because I can't really imagine we're going to have much fall baseball to see guys, you know, like I was saying in conferences that aren't playing, you know, it's not safe to play football and you're not playing fall sports. Why would you have fall baseball? That, that mm-hmm. I, I can't imagine that. And then if you don't have football in a lot of these places and who even knows if you can keep football going in the SEC in the ACC in the big 12, you know, if you can't, are we going to have spring sports? Are we going to have spring baseball? You know, I, I, I can't imagine. I, 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 if I had to guess, and we're just guessing, I can't imagine we're going to have normal college baseball next year. We might have 
some college baseball. Like I, I bet we have some, but there's no way we're going to have 300 Division One teams and all these other places playing. There's no way. Yeah, and I think the other part of it too is you have to think about what the roster crunch is at a lot of these D1 programs where you know they have top you know top cl- uh, the class sort of recruits guys that didn't go in the draft. We had a shortened draft last year, so a lot of those guys that maybe signed from we'll say round five to round six to round 20 that maybe get an overslot bonus because there's more money to play with. None of those guys signed. Right. All those guys are going to campus. Uh, to further complicate things, we have a lot of junior colleges that historically can't produce, you know, a handful of guys, especially from rounds, you know, 10 to 20 that can pop. A lot of those guys aren't coming along. And then we look at these, that these power five schools and some of them have, you know, Look at Florida. I mean, they have two top arms that certainly would have gone in the draft last year had it been a full, normal MLB draft season. Um, I think Terry Mays priced himself out, though. So he might yeah, not have gone. I think, it was, I think it was on purpose. But yeah. does he price himself out necessarily if there's more money for teams to play True. with and yeah. they can invest a little bit more? I don't know if he does. Yeah. Because going, going back for their extra year really can kill your leverage. So those guys had a little bit more leverage this year. Um, so there's even a crunch on the rosters to get a lot of these guys playing time. Um, and I think even some of the transfer stuff is unusual. We're not seeing that probably as much as we would have had previously. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff in flux because we're coming into fall where we typically get those looks after some of these summer leagues in terms of who's at summer leagues and where the, the talent is. It's dispersed between whatever Grand Perry, what was it? Grand View? I, I was Grand, forgetting. Grand Park. Grand Park, the one up in, in, in uh, Indiana. We have Coastal, which has like Cusick. I have, you know, I was at a Futures yeah. game on Saturday. I saw Cody Morissette at South Relic, but it's almost kind of, I mean, they're playing against guys that are, you know, lower Division One teams, like ho- kids that play at yeah. Holy Cross that will probably never play professional baseball. A lot of guys that are Division Three players at colleges like Stonehill and Wheaton College, where, you know, guys that weren't even starters in my, my high school team went and played <laughs> collegiate baseball, you know? So just in terms of like, I expect every time Cody Morissette or Sal Frelick gets up to, to hit an 86 mile per hour fastball with the wall, yeah. you know, like it's not being challenged. It's much different than the Cape where, you know, any given night I could see, you know, um, Wolf from, from West Virginia, start the game, Kyle Nichols from, from ball state come in after him. And, you know, maybe even Casey Schmidt come in to close the game. Right. And on the other side, you know, you're seeing five or six guys that are going to go in the top five rounds of the draft that are in the lineup for, you know, Bourne or Orleans or whoever. So, you know, the way the town is first out, even those looks don't really mean the same, you know, it, it, it's very different. Now, yeah. that I, I wanted to sort of change the conversation here because we did talk a little bit about, you know, your coverage with area code games and uh, we're close to the guys at PG and, you know, we've been all yeah. over some of the showcase circuits and you know, East coast pro and PG national um, certainly the All-American game that's coming up. But we do feel, and we said this off air, that we do have a better feel for high school players. It seems like it's a little bit more normal. Um, what are you hearing from teams in, in that regard? Do they feel more comfortable with the prep side of things right now, just simply because of the nature of how things have played out with the showcase circuit? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean the showcases, I mean, I'm just making up a number here, but I feel like teams – have like, I don't know, 80 or 90% of the looks that would have gotten the guys normally. Yeah. Um, you know, and they're going to have, I mean, as of now, Jupiter, you know, where you have, I mean, you have a hundred something teams. I don't know how, how you can socially distance all those golf carts down there, but, but like, you know, in, in any case, I mean, they're going to have Jupiter too. So you, you're getting most of your looks, you're getting data on guys, you know, you're getting, you know, spin rates and spin axes and, and stuff that, you know, can't just do by showing up at a random game, you know, game you mm-hmm. run to do. So, yeah, no, I think they feel fairly comfortable with the high school guys. Um, I mean, I had somebody like, I had a scouter to make the point to me that they're really comfortable with high school guys. Like the college guys, they know the fame, they know the names that are famous. Mm-hmm. But like, you, they haven't, you're like, like, I'm going to actually do this. I mean, I don't have to spend millions of dollars, so it's fine, and I'll, I'll do the best I can. We'll do a college of fifth, top 15 or top 20 like we do at the end of the summer every year, but it's kind of based on hearsay. <laughs> you know, it's you just don't know. But, yeah, I feel with the high school guys, they feel like they have enough data they could draft. Until, like, if, if the draft were today, it would be very interesting because you, you'd just be guessing on the college guys, but you'd feel like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm not okay, – no, like, as we all know, and, and maybe listeners do or don't know, the summer is the most important time for the high school guys. 
you, know, you talk about the level of competition, you know, like Ed Howard, I, I live in Chicago. Ed Howard was at Mount Carmel here in, in, in Chicago. In a Temple Spring, like I guess they were going to NHSI uh, tournament in, in Cary. So that would have been one exposure. But like he's not facing that many pro pitchers in, in Illinois high school ball. So like the really important time to scout Ed Howard is the summer before when he's facing the best pitchers in the country at these various showcases. So I think they're in good shape with that. Um, I, I think they feel reasonably comfortable with high school guys right now. I mean, you'll want to see how guys look next spring and, you know, they're young, how their bodies change, what happens with pitchers, et cetera. But, man, it's uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's like tail two cities, really, with high school and college right now. Yeah, and I have a quick follow-up, Joe, if you don't mind. Um, and I think the funny thing, too, is, is you could almost look at it. They have more looks at these high school guys. And with the roster crunch at a lot of these colleges, which should have sort of far reaching effects beyond even just the 2021 season, um, they may have a little bit more leverage with these high school guys, too, to get them to actually go into pro ball, have an opportunity, especially if, you know, hopefully by next spring things are a little bit better. And there is, you know, the opportunity for a full minor league season or at least a semblance of one, whether it starts a little bit late, but at least they're going to get into camp. And there's probably an opportunity for them to at least work uh, on the complexes, extended spring, something like that, just because, you know, they're professional teams. They have a little bit more money, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm kind of interested to see what happens there, too. It just seems like there's so much that could happen on the on the high school side. And the college guys, like you said, they're missing this huge development year. I mean, you know, if we're going back a couple of years, even, you know, that, that was the year. And that's when Alec Manoa broke out, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, um, every year there's guys. Houston, right there's so many of these guys that really weren't top, you know, day one guys until after that summer. Nick Gonzalez last year. How about Nick Gonzalez last year? I mean, oh, tell me about it. He had a great. I tweeted year. out the first time I saw him, like in the first game with Katu, and I said, "This guy is a first rounder and probably in the top 15." When I saw him go Apo Taco with a 96 mile per hour fastball up in the zone, I was sold. <laughs> But yeah, and if, like if he let's say the pandemic had been a year earlier, then he doesn't go seventh to the to yeah. The, because so many people made the comment, like you know where he plays, you know New Mexico yeah. State, and his ball carries and opponents. It's like it's it's a real great place to put up numbers. So nobody really believes it. There's always a guy hitting four twenty. Yeah. Um, and then he went up to Cape and proved he was real. I mean, Karen Majinski was a guy who barely pitched because he had broke foot South Carolina. Exactly. Had a great you know, and he probably. I actually think he might have gone higher if we didn't have the pandemic this year because he would have had more time to pitch and, and maybe build a more track record. But, like, you're right. I mean, you just don't get that opportunity for guys to prove themselves. And, and in college baseball, uh, you allude to, is going to be a, kind of a mess anyway. I mean, I would assume right now there's a bunch of incoming freshmen finding out that they don't have scholarships or they found out earlier this mm-hmm. month because a bunch of juniors and seniors came back because almost nobody – who would have gone around six through 20 signed for $20,000. Mm-hmm. And it's a huge headache too. All the guys who were freshmen last year are still freshmen. So it's, you're going to have this roster log jam for three or four years in college. And at the same time, you're going to have fewer minor league teams, you know, probably 120 next year, but it might be 90. I mean, that's been reported that it could just be 90 perhaps. Mm-hmm. In which case there's going to be fewer opportunities um, I, I think there's going to be, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of guys. I mean, what happened this year stunk, obviously, from the way they set the draft with the 20000 max. There are going to be guys who should have taken the $20,000 who aren't going to get a chance to play pro ball. Um, That's right. You're going to have teams have to cut players next year. Probably some of these guys who signed for $20,000 who never play. They aren't going to have spots for them to play. Um, we're going to – right now we're scheduled to have a 20-round draft. That could change too. It could be fewer. But – you know, just the simple math tells you, I mean, all the guys this year around six or 20 didn't get drafted mm-hmm. are going to go into draft next year with guys who would have gone around six or 20 in a normal year. Only half those guys can get drafted. Plus you're going to have more junior college guys eligible because you're going to have freshmen who, who don't have a place to play, go to junior college. And if that season's close to normal, make, make, makes, you know, make a name for themselves. So it's, there's just so much uncertainty. Um, you're right. I mean, I, I still, I think getting back to the high school players and, and leverage, I think the best high school players, you know, they'll, they'll still get paid. But like that guy who might be like a seven, like if we have a normal draft next year, like a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar player, or maybe he's on the fence. Do I sign for five hundred? I'm not sure. Um, you know, I could I could be a lot better three years from now. Maybe you sign for five hundred because you don't know what the landscape of college baseball is going to be. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, the value, the sheer value of a spot in an org is is invaluable right now, at least at least this year and next year, just having a spot in an organization where they invest capital in you um, is worth more than the bonus that you might sign. And then, uh, you know, another thing that I wanted to bring up in terms of just how the 2021 draft might shake out, the high school guys might have that leverage, but at the same time, if you're a pro scout and you're looking at a, a Gunnar Hogland or you're looking at a Ty Madden or, you know, any of these guys that at least have 30 to 50 college innings under their belt, Jonathan Cannon, um, there, there's also the peace of mind that, okay, I've seen this guy perform in the SEC, you know? Um, so my question is years ago, the thing is, it's crazy. You saw him two years ago. Cause you didn't see him. That's in the true. You that's saw true, him, but were you paying attention to him? When he was a freshman, maybe not. But there's film, but there's film on it, is my thing. So right, there's. Yeah. So my question would be, as it pertains to a pecking order in the 2021 draft, do you think a slowdown like this is a coup for the high school kids that are getting the looks, that are getting in front of these scouts because it's the only thing that scouts are doing right now? Or do you think it's still going to be a little bit status quo in that, okay, yeah, these college guys haven't pitched 130 innings, but they've pitched 40 innings, and at least I've seen their stuff play against co- uh, collegiate talent. Like it's it's a tough it's a it's a catch yeah, too. I think a lot of it depends on what the college season looks like next year because I, I don't think teams are going to be that comfortable going off what they saw a guy do in conference play two years ago because so much, especially for a pitcher, so much can change. Um, you know, I, I think it comes down to talent's talent. Like you're like. Whatever the situation is, if it's back to normal, which seems very optimistic, or no college baseball, or somewhere in between that's less than perfect but better than nothing, you're just going to have to kind of make do with what you have. You know, I, I can't remember if we said this on camera or off camera before we started. Yeah, their teams are going to be very comfortable, you know, or are more comfortable with the analytic data. And they may say, look, you know, we didn't get, you know, we only got 30 innings out of this guy in 2021 in college. Mm-hmm. But we have some some TrackMan and Rapsoda data, and we see some things, and we think we can do things with that. So we're more confident in that. Or, but yeah, it's um. I, I wish I knew what next year was going to be like. I I just don't know. I mean, I, I think the high school guys, yes, you feel better about them. But then the flip side is, you have teams that aren't comfortable drafting high school players. Yeah, mm-hmm. you have owners who I don't know. What are we projecting revenues for baseball this year at? I have no idea. It's not going to be ten billion dollars. You're going to have owners going to be like, why do I want to pay a high school guy four million dollars when he's not going to help my team five years from now? You're going to have GMs who are embattled, like their jobs are on the line. They're not going to draft a high school guy who's not going to help them for five years. So even though you have more comfort with them, you're going to have teams that that aren't comfortable taking high school guys in general. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what you do. Like I said, you know, Kumar Rocker is the most famous guy right now, but you know, he only pitched 15 innings or whatever it was this spring. Didn't pitch this summer. It wasn't, you know, unbelievably dominant. You know, he's he's definitely the most famous guy. But like, I mean, you can take Kumar Rocker one one and pay him seven million dollars if you don't see him again between now and next year's draft. I don't know if the owners are going to want to do that. I, I, I even wonder. I would take the under on a twenty round draft. I don't think the owners want a twenty round draft. Are going to want one. I don't think the union's going to care. Though they may make them have a draft, but I wouldn't be surprised if we had another five round draft, especially if. Baseball's limited next spring. Well, how, how can you have 20 rounds if there's no baseball in the spring? Yeah. Well, you can always draft guys. I mean, the three of us, I mean, if you gave us sure. each 20 picks. I'll put my name in the bracket, man. I'd like, get me in. in. I'm not I will thing. sign. I'll sign for 20 grand. I'll, I'll put, hey, put put it in writing. It's on video. I'll sign for 20 grand. I mean, I mean, I like, I don't, I actually don't play fantasy baseball. I play fantasy football. I'm in like four or five leagues, and I have a league I've been in for almost 30 years now. And it's a 14 team league, so it's really deep. I would draft 40 players in that draft if they let me. I'd keep going. I can always find somebody to draft. Yeah. Now, the difference is <laughs> paying the guys. If I had to pay these guys to sign, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine they're going to want to have a 20-round draft. I, I can't imagine – I mean, the first five rounds of draft this year, they didn't have to pay the guys up front. They only had to pay them 100000 up front. But they paid out like $230-something million dollars worth of bonuses. Even though it's a small fraction of what baseball's revenues are in a normal year – and it's the cheapest, most proven way to get talent. And you control it for six years in the minors and six years in the majors. I just can see owners saying, why are we spending $236 million on players who we can't, who guys aren't seeing? It's, 
I don't know. I mean, the, the doom and gloom part of me thinks, you know, once we get through the playoffs, we might have teams lay off all kinds of scouts and other employees. Yeah. And then be like, well, okay, like we're going to go with skeleton crews next year. So let's do a five round draft. I don't, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say. A lot of uncertainty. Especially yeah. when, you, when you had a team like the Rockies, who was apparent, apparently the ownership was actually pushing to cancel the draft straight out. Right. I mean, there's definitely going to be a lot of ownership. We're, we're, can't, we're pushing to can't. I mean, the MLB went to the union and said, we don't want to have a draft. Like, like it wasn't just the rock. I mean, if, 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 the way Artie I mean, Moreno, I've heard it reported, so Art, I don't know if else under the bus. It came out that Artie Moreno said no. Well, well, he, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, the, the way it went down, MLB went to the union with a proposal to have them a draft, and the union said, no, you have to have a draft, but basically said, as long as it's five rounds, you can do what you want. You know, mm-hmm. in exchange for some other stuff. I mean, it was it was a minor part or a lesser part of the negotiation where the owners got a guarantee from the players they wouldn't get sued over not getting their full salaries. And the players got guaranteed that if we had any kind of season, service time would be prorated so that free agency wouldn't be delayed for a bunch of guys. And the draft was a minor consideration. But the the, the owner, I mean, (laughs) everybody was speculating on what might happen. I mean, we're going to have reality of next year. You know, baseball made, you know, a small fraction of what the $10 billion in revenue it it made the year before was. The owners are not going to be any more in favor of having a draft. And the owners are probably going to be hearing the same stuff. Like, how are you going to draft college guys when they haven't played? And if, like I said, I, I do worry, and I have no inside knowledge. This is just me speculating. But if there is no college baseball next year or if it's severely reduced, I, I think that could be a real negative, like, in terms of, of how much of a draft we have. Yeah. Yeah. It could certainly put the draft in trouble. And uh, last point I'll make here before we wrap up, we don't want to keep you too long is I think there's a whole host of college guys. I know we interviewed Jaden uh, Hill, who's one of our favorite prospects right. in this draft from LSU. Jaden had an injury. He hasn't had you know an opportunity to really break out yet. That might have been the 2020 season. Um, he might have been great in relief in the 2020 season and then stretched out a little bit over the course of the summer, whether that was with the national team in the Cape or yeah. maybe a combination of the two, and then really came out and, and sort of taken that step forward. A lot of us think that he can because of that stuff. And once again, is a team going to want to spend – four or five, six million dollars on him. And I had I actually had a, a, a um, an area guy from a team recently say to me, you know, people didn't want to play Jack Leiter two years ago, four million dollars. He's only, you know, he's sub six feet. You know, he, he throws yeah. 90, 91, 92 most of the time. And, you know, is somebody going to want to give him six, seven, eight million dollars right out of the draft when they weren't going to give him four million dollars. And he's only thrown, let's say, 20 innings. And even if there's somewhat of a season, let's say it's 60 innings like is someone really going to want to spend that amount of money on lighter even if they do think he's somewhat polished and he's a good prospect it just throws a lot of questions you have to see him yeah i mean like his control waiver at times i mean he's a little bit bigger and thrown a little bit harder but that's that's what i was getting at like right now i think you know he'll probably be number two on our list you know he's number two on everybody's draft list you know every media guy's draft list or most media guys college draft list however you shake him out and it's like What's that based on? He pitched like 15 innings this spring. And he walked mm. eight guys. And like, come on. Like, like, you know, like again, is the owner, even if I only have to pay him a hundred thousand up front and I can defer it for two years, am I gonna want to pay him six million dollars? Like, he might be the second best prospect in college, but there's not any mm. track record for me to bank on right now. So yeah, it's I mean, these it's it's crazy. It's like <laughs> it's like one of those questions, like, are we gonna have an NFL season? Like we think we are, but who knows? Like it, it's, it's very weird. So, I mean, at least, <laughs> at least my whole summer isn't devoted to the draft because then I think it would be a little crazier, but I mean, I just, I mean, you, you guys do too, but I mean, you can hear, I, I don't know how any of this stuff's going to play out. It's weird. And I'm usually used to this time of year when we're doing the college list, you know, you have all these guys on the Cape and Timo saying everywhere else. And, it's, now it's like, oh, well, guy looked good for three weeks last spring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder whether or not they're going to give more consideration next summer to pushing the draft back into August. You know, I was going to say, I've had guys tell me they think it's going to be in July. Like, yeah. I mean, if they push it back, then at bare minimum, at least you get six weeks of the Cape for juniors. I, I think it's better than nothing. Yeah. I think the idea is to give them more time in case college baseball is reduced, then maybe yeah. have 
whether it's just the summer leagues or these regional leagues, like there's the Texas league and a Florida league and a California league and Arizona league and a Midwest league and a Northeast league. And we send everybody who we think could go in the first 10 rounds to those leagues and they play for a few weeks, but yeah, I, I think they're going to try to give themselves more time. So I think there's a very real chance. And I mean, I think, and again, this isn't like Rob Manfred has been whispering in my ear. I think in general, there's been some thought the baseball could even make a bigger event out of the draft and maybe do it as an yeah. all-star game weekend or something. Um, so you do that. So there, there's been thought, you know, I, I know it only affects a handful of players, but I know you never feel hundred percent comfortable. Let's say I spend the number three pick on a pitcher. Let's say I spend a Kumar rocker. I spend the number one pick on him next year. And he hurts his elbow in Omaha. Like, Mm-hmm. After I drafted him, like, wait a minute, what what just happened? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, and that rarely happens, but it's it's a possibility. So I think teams wouldn't mind having the draft completely after the college season, completely over. And I think next year, just because it's all the uncertainty that you know, there, there's even been a talk. I mean, I don't know if it, what the time will be. Like, college baseball's already proposed moving their season forward. I think partly because of the pandemic, but also partly just to get maybe more fans watching the game and get further away from college basketball and all that. But yeah, I think there's a possibility we could have a July draft next year. I'd love Great. it. All right, Joe, any other questions or are uh, we going to be kind enough to let uh, Jim go? <laughs> no, I mean, Jim, 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 he's always so, so gracious with his time. We, we love having him on there. So it's yeah. uh, anytime. Well, Jim, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, Joe, thank you, as always, for your insightful questions. Uh, And thanks, everybody, for uh, listening and watching. We'll be back next week with another big interview. Thanks a lot, Jim. Have a good one.